chapter 22 again. It's not from a different perspective, though. So. You know, we've we looked at this and what God provided for Abraham in that day. we made some comparisons to uh, what we have in Christ. But what I want to do in this lesson is that I want to, I want to kind of compare what Abraham did with what God does for us. Imagine as, how as hard as it was for Abraham to do what he did. I want us to try to feel the anxiety that, that he must have felt. I want us to feel the way he had to feel as he's planning, as he's going through these things um, and carrying out these things and, and then compare that to what God did. And I think quickly, and some of you are probably already thinking in your mind about some of the big differences between the way Abraham offered Isaac when you think about the way God offered Jesus. I'm not going to read uh, Genesis chapter 22 again, but it would be good for you to be open to that place as we, in the first part of the lesson, make some points from some of the verses there so you can see those verses and understand where I'm at and hopefully where I'm coming from. First, I want to think about the idea how Abraham offered his son. Again, we talked about this uh, in the last uh, lesson about how he was willing uh, to go through this. And just think about how, what a tremendous thing that says about him. And what a tremendous expression of his love for God. But you know, at the same time, when I think about this, I think about how here, so you have this sign of him going through this difficult ordeal, this difficult task. And it's because he loves God. And to even say that it was easier doesn't seem to be even fair. But it, it was somewhat easier knowing that he is giving his son to a God that loves him. So he's turned around. God has blessed him. God has demonstrated his love to Abraham again and again and again. And so now Abraham is this turn around and offering his son as an expression of his love to God. And you know, it's only because of God and his great grace and care and love that Abraham even had this son to offer. You remember that Isaac was the son of a 100-year-old man and a barren woman. And so that's where he comes from, the son of promise. And to see him being willing then to turn that son over to God is a great expression of the love that he has for God. And it still had to be hard to saddle that donkey and to head out for Mount Moriah. We also see in this moment that uh, Abraham has three days to think about. This is a three-day journey from where they were to Mount Moriah. Again, in the, the previous lesson, I talked about how impressed I am by that, and I still am impressed by the idea that, that God said, I want you to offer your son. The very next morning, he gets up to head out on the walk road. But, you know, maybe it was just easier that way as well. I mean, you know, maybe it, it was it was easier not to wait extra days just to get this thing over with. And I, I would imagine that it's, it was still the longest three days of his life making this journey, thinking about what he was about to do. We only live in Albany, we only live about maybe 15 minutes from the airport. And after, when our kids come home, I'm the one that takes them to the airport. I'm the one to go get them from the airport, take them to the airport. And um, I hate taking my kids to the airport. And one reason is because they like to fly at like 6 o'clock in the morning, so i got to get up at 4 to take them to the airport. But the other thing I hate, I just hate the drive. I hate sitting there, getting closer and closer to the airport, knowing that my kids are about to leave. You know, I remember the first time uh, Faith came home from college and, you know, the first time she's been away from us for that long, and so now I'm taking her back to the airport. 
And, and I, I got home and I told Teresa, I said, well, I kept it together until Faith got out of the car. But man, once she was out of the car, I just boo it all the way home. You know, hard that is, anticipating something like that. Can you imagine spending three days thinking about what you're going to do to your son when you get where you're going? Imagine every step of the way getting closer and closer. The bigger that knot got in his stomach. I don't know the answer to this question. What do y'all think they talk around about around the fire at night when they stop? Do you think that this sacrifice that they're going to prepare might have come up in conversation? How many times did Abraham have to think about what was going to happen once he and Isaac got to that mountain? Just like I said earlier, you know, uh, how you play conversations you're going to have over and over again in your mind. Or maybe you're just going someplace where you've been before and you know what to do, but you still kind of play it over and over again in your mind. Um, I have this terrible habit. Uh, when my phone rings and I, I look there and say, oh, that's my friend Dave. I know what he wants to talk about. And sometimes like, oh, that's sister so-and-so. Oh. Hello? <laughs> you know, just that, that awful anticipation. So again, can you imagine what it must have felt like for Abraham making that journey? Did y'all notice that Abraham took care of all the details for this sacrifice? In verse 3, it says, well, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, he split the wood for burnt offerings and arose and went to the place which God told him to go. In verse 6, it says, well, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid on Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went up together. In verse 9, then they came to the place in which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar placed the wood in order. He bound Isaac, his son, and laid on him, laid him on the altar, upon the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand. Abraham is taking care of all the details. You know why. Who else would you trust in this task? Who else would you want doing this? Because this is your son, this is what you are been called to do, but, but you're going to make sure it's done absolutely at, with the most mercy, quick as possible, Again, I, I don't know this, but I think I put myself in that situation every step of the way. I know what's rolling in my head over and over again. Uh, again, a dumb illustration, I know. But yesterday, I'm standing in line, going through security, and I reach in my pocket, and guess what I feel? Pocket knife. Not just any pocket knife, y'all. My case, toothpick, pocket knife. What, what do I do? You know, the plane's going to take off in 30 minutes or something. The lady at the TSA, first of all, I just handed her my knife. I have a backup, by the way. Handed her my knife, and, she, and she's like, I'm like, she's like, are you surrendering this? I'm like, well, I guess I am, you know? But so then after that, I, I can't stop thinking about, maybe if I had just put it in my backpack, maybe they wouldn't see me. You know, how come I put it in my pocket to begin with? Well, because I put this knife in the bag like I was supposed to. I needed something to get my other knife put up. But if I had just had that, you keep playing these things out over and over again, right? And then you just think about him facing what he does. How many times do you think, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to time like this. I'm going to use this kind of knot. I'm going to lay him and stretch out his neck just this way. I'm going to slice just this way because that's the quick time. How many times did he think about things like that over the next three days? I mean, can y'all even fathom asking yourself the question, what is the most merciful way for me to kill my son? Abraham must have just been elated to know that he didn't have to go through it. I mean, again, in my mind's eye, He's got Isaac stretched out on that altar. He's got that knife position just ready, to, you know. And all of a sudden, he goes, Abraham, Abraham. He's like, yes! I don't have to go through this. I don't have to do this. From the beginning, he thought he was going to. He thought God would bring Isaac back from the dead. So he thought he was going to have to go through this. Again, I cannot imagine any praise greater. 
than coming down the mountain knowing he didn't have to do what he thought he was going to do. I mean, he, Abraham had to go from the, the lowest low to the highest high when he saw that ram caught in a thicket. How great that moment must have been. So when we understand that, and when we can in some small way feel what Abraham felt those three days in that moment, what I really want us to do is appreciate how different it was for God. Abraham had only three days to think about what he was about to do. God has been had been thinking about it since the beginning of time. First Peter chapter one and then verse eighteen. First Peter chapter one and then verse um, verse uh, really the sentence begins back in verse thirteen of the idea begins back in verse thirteen. Ten must be holy as God is holy. Verse seventeen says if you call on the Father without partiality judges according to each man's work conduct yourself in times or stay or in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corrupt things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your father, or the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So God knew from the beginning that this is what was going to have to happen. That this, Paul talks about this being in, in Ephesians chapter 3, part of God's eternal purpose in doing uh, Christ and, 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 and sacrificing Christ, is what I'm trying to say. He, he knew that. Now, some of us say, hey, well, yeah, the time to, to, to God, uh, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Listen, y'all, that don't mean God can't tell time. That doesn't mean that, that God doesn't observe the passage of time. Really, what that means is that if God makes you a promise today, it's as good 10,000 years from now. That's really, God is not slack in showing his promises. That's really the idea. It's not that God can't tell time. So, for thousands of years, God knows what's going to happen to Jesus. And, and he's planning to see that it happens. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to show us the Father. And if so we can look at Jesus and understand something about the Father, then I think we can begin to appreciate a little bit how anxious God was, how this did play out in God's mind. Because as Jesus gets closer to the cross, he starts talking about his death more and more. And y'all know you talk about what's on your mind. And so in, in Mark 8, 31, and Mark 9, 31, and beginning in uh, Mark 10, 32, and the next couple of verses, Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. And each time, he gives a few more details. What's he thinking about? He's thinking about dying on that cross. Do you remember when Jesus was transfigured? Was it at the beginning of his ministry? It was the end of his ministry. And Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah were talking to him about his increase, about his exodus. They're talking about him fixing to die. What's on his mind? What is he thinking about? You remember what Jesus said in the garden about the way he felt? He was burdened almost to death. He, as he prayed, he sweat great drops of blood. But maybe you don't believe that was real blood. Have you ever prayed so much that you sweat? That's what Jesus is doing. What's he concerned about? Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I'm saying all of that so that we can understand that, that it just, it, it wasn't easy for God. I, again, I, I want to be very careful about speaking for him, but we know he has emotion. He can, he can be pleased. He can be angry. 
there are passages in the prophets that kind of make it clear that this plan was a hard thing for God to think about. Well, we also talked about how Abraham took care of all the details, but who took care of the details with Christ? This is really the passage that got me thinking uh, about this lesson in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Sometimes this little phrase that really catch my attention. And in Romans chapter 8 verse 32 it says, He did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. He delivered Him up. Abraham took care of all the details. Who took care of the details with Christ? His enemy. In those passages, Mark 8, 9, and 10, where he starts talking about his death, he says, I'm going to be delivered over the chief priest. How do they feel about Jesus? And then they're going to hand me over to the Gentiles. How do they feel about the Jews? Those were the people who were going to carry out this sacrifice. See, Isaac was killed, or was going to be killed, in the most merciful way possible. And just the opposite is true with our Lord. And God knew. God knew exactly the way Jesus would be treated. Again, let's look now at Mark 10, uh, beginning in verse 32, the passage that I've referenced a couple of times. Mark 10 and verse 32. It says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. I want you to notice that. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen, but where is he? He's leading the way. He's out front. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. He took down the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that happened to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him. They will scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. I think it's hard for us to even imagine the emotions that must have been churned in the people who read this to begin with or actually heard Jesus say that. To say, that I'm going to be scourged. I mean, that was such a horrible thing. I, I remember the movie that was made many years ago, The Passion of the Christ. And in that movie, uh, they depicted the scourging of Jesus. For me, I'll be honest with you, that was worse to watch than the crucifixion itself. Just to know the punishment that they uh, <clears throat> threw at him. After the scourging, Pilate would even bring him out and say, Behold the man. And I think hoping to say, hoping to show how horribly he had been beaten so that they would say, okay, enough is enough. That's how horrible this scourging was. So God knew that this was the way Jesus was going to be treated, and guess what? His enemies did not prove him wrong. We turn over to Mark chapter 15. This is kind of a, a lengthy reading, but man, it is so important. I hope that you'll follow along and pay attention to the words and think about what's happening to your Lord. Um, this is after he has said, the pilot said, you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? You know, who do you want, Barabbas or this guy? And then in verse 11 it says, but the chief priest stirred the crowd so that they should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said again, What then do you want me to do with him who you call the king of the Jews? They cried out, Crucify him. Then Pilate said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, uh, released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus after he scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. They called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. 
And they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. Bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, a man about the father of Alexander and Rufus. He was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine whatever man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of the accusation was written above him, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves and scribes. He saved others, can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness only a whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those stood by and when they heard that said, look, he's calling for a light. Then someone ran and filled a sponge of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him. Others said, let him alone. Let's see if the light will come take it. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his life. They mistreated him before during and even after he died. They spat on him, beat shame upon him, even as he spoke dying words. I'm making fun of him. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come here. Again. Can you imagine turning your son over to be killed by somebody who hates you? And they hate your son even more. That's what Jesus, that's what God did in offering Jesus. And as we just read, there, there was no ram caught in the thicket. There was no Stop, stop. Now I know. Can y'all imagine standing back while your son cries, Daddy, Daddy, why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen to me? Why aren't you helping me? See his chest rise and fall for the last time. Brethren, that's why the sun refused to shine that day. To me, it's like God turning out the lights because you just can't watch it. Don't ever think tell you for God. Jesus said to Peter, I can call 12 legions of angels right now. God held them at bay. And let his only begotten Son be crucified on the cruel cross of Calvary. <clears throat> Abraham offered his son to somebody that he loved. He was offering his son to God that loved him, and he loved God. 
Think about who God was offering His Son for that day. The passage that was read a few moments ago in Romans chapter 5 talks about the kind of people that Jesus died for. People like you and me. And in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That was us. In verse 8 it says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You guys have spit on Jesus? The guys who said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come. He just died for them. People like me. You know, maybe I wasn't there that day spitting on him. But some of the things I've done in my life is the same thing. Maybe I didn't swing the, the whip that beat him on his back. Maybe I didn't smack him across his face. But some of the things I've done in my life, it's the same thing. Very good. That's who he died for. People who, at the time of his death, was his enemy. People who hated him and demonstrated the way that they hated him in the way that he treated them. This is what, why the Hebrew writer says, how much worse punishment do you suppose that we be counted worthy when we trample the Son of God on their feet? Simply when we sin, when we know better. We crucify the Lord all over again. So when we look at the cross of Christ, we have to remember, we're not worthy of that sacrifice. We, we can never be worthy of that sacrifice. For God's Son to die in my place? And you never look at the cross and think, man, God, I really got a bargain here. God, this is really something sweet God got for me. God, you're so lucky to have a servant like me. You must really love me a lot because I'm so cool. No. God does love me a lot. But it's not because of how cool I am. It's because of how awesome I am. He is. He is the only thing that can rightly be called all. Think about how much grace and mercy was there that day. Think about how much God does love you. See how unworthy you are of that. Has anybody in your life ever had to forgive you of something that you some dumb thing that you did that was a big dumb thing. And I, I, I can think of multiple things in my own life. I did something really dumb, foolish, hurtful, sinful. And I had to look at somebody in the face and say, I'm sorry. Can you please forgive me? In that instant, you know you're not worthy of it. You're not worthy in the least. I forgive you, Jesus, though. I forgive you. I love you. And we'll get past this. I mean, you, you, you remember that feeling? That's the feeling you should get every time you look at the cross. Every time you think about the cross. Every time you sing about the cross. Every time you read about the cross in the Bible. That's what you should think to yourself. I am so unworthy. God loves me so much. That's why I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing everything that I can to glorify and honor the sacrifice that was made for me. Understanding that even if I do that, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. God loves me and wants me to be delivered. How much does God want you to be delivered? Look at the cross. How bad is your sin? Look at the cross. What death do you deserve? Look at the cross. Ultimately, finally, and forever. Yeah.
dying for you so that you can be delivered. Because not only does God love you, but the man hanging from the cross loves you as well. And he wants you to be his. The Bible is full of these shadows of Jesus. There's so many times you're reading the Old Testament, like, oh man, this reminds me of uh, something about Jesus. And, and those illustrations are really cool and help us understand Jesus. But isn't it interesting that every single one of them pales in comparison? I mean, we can look back and look at Isaac being offered and say, oh, yeah, it's only parallel between Jesus. You do. But Jesus shines even brighter. It is amazing what Abraham was willing to do, but it doesn't compare to what God did. Paul says that the things recorded in the Old Testament were written for our learning. And this morning, I hope you have a better understanding of how much or how true that really is. And I hope you have a better understanding of how much you need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I hope you understand how much God really loves you. When we say that there is no greater gift than the gift of Jesus Christ, I hope this morning that you understand even more how true that is. And, and again, this is not this is not Simon the preacher saying this. This is just Simon, the guy who heard about Jesus, was amazed about Jesus. And so here's what I'm thinking. How can you hear about Jesus and not want to serve him? How can you look at the cross of Christ and see what Jesus did and not? That's just not for me. You know, that might be for some people, but not for me. But you don't want to be free from sin. You, you want to be worthy of the death that he died? You don't want to someday be gathered around a throne with countless saints telling you this man, this God incarnate, how much you love him and appreciate what he did for you. I, I, I can't for the life of me understand why anybody walk up to Jesus. He says, give me your life. I'll let you live forever. You know, look, if you live to be 100 years old, at the end of your 100 years, you're going to look back and think that was a short time. You make it happen, and this life will be nothing. You have a great opportunity this morning to come to Jesus and, and to give your life to Him. The words behind me are all His words. This is what He says. It's not what I teach. It's what I believe. It's what I do teach. I, I didn't come up with this. This is all Jesus. If you want to be saved this morning, you have a great opportunity. God has delivered you down to this, your life in this place, down to this place. Maybe to hear this lesson. And I hope you'll come to Jesus this morning and be saved. Maybe you not living like you should. You're a Christian. You've been baptized, but you know better, and you're just not living like y'all do. Change. If we can help you in any way, won't you let us know right now as you're standing in the